Welcome to Discovery New Film. I'm your host, Jeff Howard, and I've got Rachel Thomas Medwood with me. Hey, Rachel. Hi. Hey. All right. So we just finished Rachel's interview about her writing and directing. Uh, she's got a handful of films under her belt at this point, and I'm just going to uh, brag about her. She came to the Sherman Oaks Film Festival in 2018 with a pilot called The Lost Opera and won the Grand Jury Prize for Best Pilot. And then she showed up at the festival program a year and a half later, Film Vacation Los Angeles in 2020. Her film, The Squirrels in the Attic, showed up and pulled in an audience award. And I have to say, it was a bummer because I was hoping she was going to come out and COVID stopped that. That ended up being a virtual festival. And one year later, at another virtual festival, uh, her film in the company of Crows that she wrote and directed was uh, also an official selection and won, won an award for production design. So Rachel is a multi-award winning writer and director. Why, thank you. And, you know, not to brag about you, you know, I, uh, Rachel is also my uh, pretend Facebook. Friend. We've been Facebook friends now since 2018. So, like, you know that thing where you're friends on Facebook and you've met the person once in real life or for a week in real life and you're like... And yet, because you've seen them go through life for four or three and a half years, you're like, I feel like I know you. So Definitely. this is an overly familiar interview <laughs> slash four questions episode. <laughs> but that is what it is. It's four questions episode. So in this episode, last episode, we talked about uh, Rachel's films and how she came up as a writer. And by the way, her that first film I mentioned, The Squirrels in the Attic, is going to be in the Discover Indie Film TV series. So people who should definitely... Go to Amazon Prime Video, search for Discover Indie Film, and there's four seasons right now. There will be a fifth season, and that season will have the squirrels in the attic in it, and I guarantee you're going to like it. It's uh, a very cool genre-busting th thriller slash drama slash, uh, and honestly, it's got David Lynchy vibes, which is always a good thing. So... Watch Discover Indie Film on Amazon Prime Video, and now we're going to have Rachel answer the four questions, which are favorite films of all time, an underrated film, an overrated film, and a lesser-known film sh people should seek out. And now I'm going to shut the F up and let Rachel start answering these questions. All right. Should I start with favorites? Start with favorites. Okay. So, again, this is, I'm sure you hear this all the time, but it's very hard to narrow it down. So, so it's a pain in the ass. It is. I was like, think, you know, thinking and thinking. And I, I kind of am going with films that I felt um, like had some sort of impact while watching them, even though I didn't really know what that impact was at the time, because most of them were like from the 80s, I think. Um, so the first one is Thelma and Louise which is really one of my favorite films. It's, um, and I just watched it again uh, recently since being a filmmaker and all the, uh, aside with the stuff that I like about it, which is really um, the, the portrayal of like females as like, it shows the vulnerability of females and their strength at the same time, which is very difficult to do in, um, a realistic, like a powerful man manner, you know, it's a very powerful film and, you know, just everything about it's amazing. But like now looking at it, the, like the cinematography is like beautiful and there's like no, there's nothing in there that's not supposed to be in there. Not like any second, nothing. Like it's just so well paced. Like, so now looking at it as a filmmaker, I like it even more. Um, and I don't it think is, I, it's, a, it's a fantastic, I once read, you know, I was never a fan of Sid Field books at all on screenwriting. Yeah. But he did a book called Four Screenplays, and he selected four screenplays that he thought were just flawlessly written. And Thelma yeah. and Louise is one of them. It was, yeah. Um, flawless I, screenplay. I think I've read the screenplay, too, because usually, like, if I watch, like, I'm reading like, screenplays a lot. And um, I'll go back to ones, like, films that I love and go back to the, the screenplay and, you know, see how it was actually written. And, um, yeah, and it's just executed so well. Um and you know that that last shot. I remember. I think I was probably in high school. I think when it when I saw it in the theater. And I think I went back the next day and watched it. I was like, oh my god, that was amazing. So um, so that's my first one. And then uh, my second is um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which again is like you know anything that is inventive like that and you know outside of the box. 
but can still, um, that, that works, you know, cause it's a very weird, obviously, um, screenplay. And I've read that screenplay cause I'm like, what does that look like on the page? <laughs> you know, cause like, how, how did they write that? And that's amazingly written as well. Like it's really, they took that and they, it's almost exact, like from the screenplay and just the visuals are incredible in that as well. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, that's two films you've named where this, where the writing is remarkably good, like just yeah. remarkable writing, remarkable mm-hmm. ideas. And then the execution on the filmmaking side is, it's, is, yeah. is equal to the, the material. I mean, Eternal Sunshine, I can't think of a better film or more. Yeah. I mean, I, it's funny because it actually probably wouldn't make my favorites list, even though I, because obviously like you can't get in all your favorites, like, a top right. three is, yeah. that's what sucks about the top three, but it's fun for conversation. But yeah, Eternal Sunshine is, is a just tremendously great film. Yes. Yeah. Tremendously human. You picked two. So I'm seeing your pattern. Tremendously human stories. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm, I'm definitely drawn to that. Again, like I see human behavior, um, relationships with the people, not necessarily romantic, but just people's relationships to each other and reactions to each other. Um, and then the third one is going to go with Pulp Fiction because I had a very powerful reaction to that in the theater as well, you know, with the, um, the, the timeline, the switching of the timeline, just the, the, that pop culture dialogue, you know, that was very new at the time. Um, it really struck me, the whole thing, um, and in the characters and, um, you know, I've read that screenplay, which is also, uh, it's just amazing. Um, and <laughs> as a funny aside, I had, I got, um, John Travolta to sign my DVD <laughs> of Pulp Fiction <laughs> when he was in Boston filming, um, something else. And like, we don't get a lot of celebrities in Boston or we didn't used to. And, you know, he was right by my work and we knew the, the, uh, the the security guard and he told us, oh, John, John Travolta is going to be at his makeup trailer at 6 a.m. tomorrow. So so we went in like really early and we waited for him. And so I have that somewhere. I, was, I almost passed out. It was exciting because uh, I loved the movie so much. And he was very nice. He's a very kind person. Um, I've heard he's really nice. I have a friend who was in a film with him and she said like he was a perfect gentleman. Yeah. Nice to everyone all the time. Um, yeah. You know, crew. Yeah, everyone. That's nice. And by the way, Another amazing film. I mean, I know Tarantino at this point can be pretty divisive. Um, I'm a fan. Um, Not of everything, but in general. And I think Pulp Fiction is is an outstandingly good film. Yeah. Like, I'm a fan of his, too. But, again, not of everything. Um, And that, that for me, is his film. But, like, that, you know, obviously. It is is so fun. And... uh, You can watch it over and over again. I mean, I haven't watched it for a long time now. It's probably time to watch it again. (laughs) It is. Uh, I I remember uh, it's always a fun rite of passage for me when a a niece or nephew is old enough to show that film to. Yeah. (laughs) But you've (laughs) got to wait. you got to wait, yeah. I don't think I haven't had showed my kids. They're they're, my college kids are old enough. I don't know if they like it. I don't, they don't really like that kind of stuff, but, um, really you don't think they've seen it. Um, I don't think they'd be drawn to that. I'll ask them. I I don't know. Um, I guess there's so much to see nowadays, but there's so much to see. Yeah. So still that film talk about originality and storytelling. Well, that's why, you know, when I watched it, I think I went back to the theater again, like, and, and watched it multiple times because it was so original, you know, like when you, when you have a voice like that, those are always the ones that stick out. Like, you know, the, um, yeah, you know, know, I don't often, uh, I don't think I often share this fact, but I actually, that I went to see that alone on opening day because it was my birthday (laughs) and I was such a huge Reservoir Dogs fan. I'm like, yeah. Okay, I can't find anyone to go. So I just like went, I like took the day off on my birthday and like went to a matinee in Westwood, California and saw Pulp Fiction on opening day at a matinee just because I was like, I could not wait to see another film from this Tarantino dude who had made one movie up to that point. Yeah. So, did, were, did you have that reaction too? Where you're like, oh my God. <laughs> I just thought it was the great. I just could not. Yeah. I mean, there's not that many times in my life when I can say I went with huge expectations and walked out happy. <laughs> 
Right? Yeah. Um, I didn't have any actually going in because I hadn't seen Reservoir Dogs. Um, so I just I went in kind of blind. Like I, I didn't even know what we were going to. And I was like, Oh what? God, talk about an amazing way to see a film. I mean, it's always yeah. good to have no expectations. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, and and totally. I mean, all three films you're talking about encompass so much. But I mean, Pulp Fiction is when he was still like. You know, it's like there's some really slow patches on purpose. Yeah. You know, and, and meditative stuff. So it's really, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, you know, actually, I guess I could see that, that in your work. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you show a lot of patience as a director. And oh, I, yeah. No, you're right. I, I, I am. I, I don't, um, I, I tell the story how I feel like it needs to be told without the, the pressure of what someone's going to expect. Um, so yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, uh, which just goes to show. So you definitely are leaning towards not, not like everyone doesn't, but, but well, well well-written films that, that are off the beaten path. I mean, there's, there's an element of originality to those for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, the second question is a film that's underrated. Underrated. What did I think about? Oh, um, I think uh, I was going to go with the, uh, like Christopher Guest movies. Um, I just love them so much. Like best in show is just one of the best. Uh, you can watch that over and over again. And not that they're not appreciated films, um, like waiting for Guffman. That's another one. Like, uh, I think they're appreciated, but they might be underrated. And because, um, I think they're really smart. Like it's just a very intelligent sense of humor. Um, that, um, you know, not everybody loves, loves that, but I think they're, they're really smart and just hilarious. And, uh, I think you're probably right in my little bubble of the world. I think they're held in incredibly high esteem, but I'm sure I could just go to the mall and walk out to people and say, have you seen best in show? And it's going to be 99 out of a hundred say no. Yeah, I think that's your bubble. I mean, there's little bubbles all over. Like, I know people who love it, too. Uh, but I think, in general, that a lot of people don't wouldn't know who Christopher Gass is. No, no, I could they be wouldn't. Wrong. Yeah, or I don't think they would like, you know, a lot of people wouldn't enjoy it either, like the mockumentary type. Um, that's true. It's such a, uh, it is a specific taste, I guess. It is, but I, I love that. Like, but damn, <laughs> they're it. so funny. I will never... I mean, Parker Posey. <laughs> She's the best. And the bee. <laughs> I yeah, see we're both laughing at something that we probably haven't seen for years. No, I, know, I haven't actually, seen it for years. <laughs> I know. I, I, that's one of the ones I bet I would probably love to go on a, on a guest binge. Start with, I was wondering if it would be worth showing the kids Spinal Tap now that she's in high school. Like, would, oh, would it? Would it work for a young person or not? Like, or did you have to grow up on 80s hair metal to get it? I don't know. Yeah, that would be interesting to see if if someone who didn't got it. Um, yeah, I, maybe I'll maybe I'll have a little marathon too. And do I haven't seen Waiting for Guffman for a long time either, and that I, I think that's a little bit of a super. So. And you know, I still one of my favorite comments is to call is to say you people are asshole people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, excellent. So it's just the whole Christopher Guest canon. I guess so, yeah. Which, in a way, and doesn't it suck that he kind of stopped? Like, I don't think yeah. he's done anything since For Your Consideration. Yeah, and I didn't love that one as much. but um, That one was a letdown, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mighty did, Wind was yeah. great, but... That was, that was good, too. Uh, yeah, there's so much fodder, too. Like, I actually think of things sometimes, like um, like the like crafting people. Like I was like, Oh, that'd be such a great, like Christopher, like whenever I see like a, like a group of people that <laughs> I was like, he should make a movie about. <laughs> I know, uh, so and Oddly did. enough, you'd think someone else would pick up the torch at some point. Yeah. Hmm. But you'd have to, it'd have to be somebody who had a lot of friends <laughs> who were talented. <laughs> yes, exactly. Cause those ensembles, <laughs> Oh my God. Putting those ensembles together. I mean, but again, I might I might want to throw that weight in your backpack and say, okay, you're building up this repertoire of uh, of actors you really like working with. So, 
you better work your way up to a uh maybe they'll a, do a mockumentary an next. ensemble <laughs> mockumentary about you know some hilarious new england uh you know <laughs> I, I won't show off my ignorance of new england by bringing up any kind of witch trial or anything all right so and then i did uh the next one is overrated oh um okay this one is hard too um I'm going to go with Titanic just cause I couldn't think of um, a lot. And I had this funny uh, feeling relationship about James Cameron. Like I love Terminator. Like I love some of his stuff. Um, and, but I think Titanic as much, you know, I know what it is. It's a spectacle and like that part's amazing. And it's not that I don't like it. Um, but I think it's just kind of cliche and the story is a little boring. Um, it, it's not original is I guess what I'm trying to say. And as we've established, I really like original. Things. So I think just, I think it's overrated for that reason that like that story, it's not that hard to come up with. For sure. No, you, uh, and that's, I always, I didn't bother with the preamble on that question, but overrated doesn't mean bad. It doesn't mean you think right. it's a bad film. It just means, you know, it gets, uh, it is a lot of people's favorite of all time, I think. But yeah, I think you're right. He he was amazed by the Titanic itself when he saw the submerged footage, right? And yeah, really want to make it. And then he said, "Okay, I'll just. I guess I'll just throw Romeo and Juliet on that boat." And, <laughs> and, right. Uh, but again, it's not terrible. I mean, it's nothing bad about yeah, it. It's just like it's like. Yeah. I remember loving it the first time I saw it, but it was really you know for the spectacle. Yeah, and I mean, I, if it if it's on, not that I watch live TV anymore, but I would absolutely sit there and watch it. Like you get sucked in, so like there's you know, um, but so that's but that's the, I couldn't come, I couldn't think of a lot. So also, I don't, I don't think the visuals hold up. You don't think so? I think I it was think just it a little too early on the computer graphics. Yeah, and I think most of the ship shots, ship so, shots. Yeah. All the people walking on board look really animatronic. Like you can, it's, it's actually bad digital animation. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'd have to go back and watch it. Now I'm going to have to watch that again too. Yeah. Um, but I did, you know, it's funny. I took his master class, um, and I didn't think I was going to like it because he can be kind of whatever. And it was an awesome, <laughs> it was excellent. It was one of my favorites and he is very, he's an amazing artist which I didn't know because he shows his like storyboards and stuff. And it's insane. I was like, Oh my God. So he's, I think he's just a very, very visual um, storyteller, but I couldn't believe his artwork and, and his class was excellent. So then I, then I, I liked him after that. Yeah, actually I've been uh, a major Cameron apologist for years, like decades. Yeah. Even. Like whenever people talk about him being an asshole or something, I'm like, okay, wait, time out. Yeah. He, whether the same actors work with him over and over, the same yeah. crew work with him over and over, if somebody is fucking up on his set and causing a problem, he probably doesn't handle it as well. He should just fire people without yelling and screaming. But <laughs> if you do your job, you don't have a problem with the guy. Like, yeah. Like, well, know. it's funny. He actually addresses his reputation, that reputation in his master class, like right off the bat. And he yeah. admits, he says, you know, I've been always, you know, been the best with that part. But uh, yeah, so, I mean, he's an intense guy. And that, that you know. He is. But, but, if, if, but if, you know, whatever, I'm sure, I'm sure we could talk to a lot of people who work with him over and over and over. And they're like. Yeah. He's great to work with. There's, sure. He's a great guy. And he's, he's uh, and he makes amazing. Me I'm a big Avatar supporter. I, yes. it's, I, it's funny because we, we could probably have an Avatar debate because you were making fun of Titan. But I was when people were like, oh, I've seen Pocahontas <laughs> before. I'm like, yeah, yeah. The way Pocahontas is about a, a quadriplegic soldier who gets to walk again through virtual reality. Yeah, I'm so tired of that. <laughs> But who knows what I'll think of the next five Avatar movies, and maybe he's just going to burn that bridge with me. But I, I, I think it's, I think he's, I think he's, he's actually underrated. Okay. Titanic, I'm with you. Titanic being overrated, okay. but I think Cameron as an artist might be underrated. Maybe I think he's 
he's obviously like really intelligent and really good at what he does. So I'm not making yeah. fun of him. And he's probably too successful to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for most of the world to handle. I remember he's a cocky asshole too. I remember him saying something about avatar. Like he was able to do something with the DVD. Like there was no ads for other films in front of the DVD. Like, you know, it wasn't like also from yeah. the studio. And he said, "Yeah, whenever I make the studio a billion dollars, I, I get to I get to just start my film right off the bat on the DVD." And it was like, "Oh my god, this guy's bragging that he's got two billion dollar films!" Like, <laughs> but he does. So yeah, he yeah. does. I mean, it's telling the truth <laughs> for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, you only got one more, which is okay. a lesser known to seek out. Um. So, have you heard of? Film. It's from the eighties again. Uh, the film Cousin, Cousins, not Cousin, Cousins. Um, I am aware of the French one and the American one. Okay, so yes, yeah, so it's on the <laughs> French one. I you like the Ted Danson uh, one. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely. Lo- Whenever I talk to people, they've never seen it, and I was like, I loved it. It might be a little dated now. I haven't seen it recently, but I watched that over and over again. And I think it was just such a great portrayal of just like re- human relationships and like how complex they are and families. And um, yeah, like I love Isabella Rosalini and Sean Young. I love, <laughs> so um I love that film. And I, every time I, I mean, I have brought it up lately, but I remember even back then I was like, oh, do you love that film Cousins? And everyone's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I don't know why it wasn't, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was just me, but. No, you know, I don't think you're wrong. I don't know many. I mean, I happen to have been, I didn't see the French, but I knew it was, I think it was Cousine Cousine. Like It I was, yeah. Both. And then, and then Cousins came out and it was, it was a well, well-regarded film, but yeah, I don't think. People don't talk about it. And I remember it being great. Yeah. I remember it sort of being a shock. I think that was like Ted Danson's first sort of step from the small screen to big. And that was back when TV actors and film was kind of yeah. not the norm. Yeah. And he's, and again, I'd have to watch it again to see if my memory is correct. But I thought he was, excellent. I thought he was very charming in it. I'm not a huge Ted Danson fan or anything, but I loved him in it. Um, well, I, the funny thing is I've become a huge Ted Danson fan over time just because he's always good. Yeah. I haven't and, watched a lot of the new, like I haven't watched a good place yet. Um, but yeah, he's uh, always been good. Um, well, I can tell you this much uh, as a writer who likes originality, you will love the good place. I know it's on my list. Although um, you should stop before the final season. <laughs> oh, did they ruin it? <laughs> I think they did. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure that I'm sure some people could get really angry at me, but I thought it was one of the best written, most original things ever. And then they, I think American TV writers don't know how to write an ending. Like in England and Canada, like you're supposed to write an ending. Whereas in America, you're supposed to try to have as many seasons as possible. So I think the American TV writer mind is trained to always never finish. Yeah. No, I, I, Totally think you're right because you know there are they have to keep you can't have an ending in mind if they want to keep having seasons right yeah um, so yeah they so they, they don't just, know how to wrap it up <laughs> they don't know how to wrap it up I if I name you know there's geez I think Breaking Bad's the only show that ended well <laughs> it's my favorite show of all time oh my god I I that's I had it's I, the the writing's phenomenal like I'm amazed by it like I've watched this. Se- series a couple times probably would do it again and it's just incredible like and they had to have planned that i mean you cannot that that wasn't a go as you make it up as you go i mean it had to all be planned out it's uh, incredible um, it's I love incredible that and and i i still can't name another show i've ever watched that was that many seasons and that tied a story where there was not one moment where i sat on the couch and said oh come on that would never happen like, like there was no bullshit shortcuts. No, it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was so good. Oh my god, I miss it. Like I'm always looking for shows that are as good as that. I haven't really found any yet that I like as much. I found some good shows, but yeah, not there's, there's as- lots of good shows. Yeah, but uh, the team that produced that produced something called Halt and Catch Fire. I don't know if you saw that. 
No. What's it called? Halt and Catch Fire. It's actually a, a term. And it was the same production team, not Vince Gilligan, yeah. but the same people that he worked with did yeah. that for AMC. Uh, it takes place in the tech world. It takes place in like, it's only conceit is that, or the conceit that pushes it too hard is it starts off as people like, are basically like, as if it was Michael Dell in his garage. Okay. And yeah. then, and then they become like the first. So it's sort of like people on the fringe, almost succeeding, becoming like the next Steve Jobs, but they don't. <laughs> ah, okay. Ooh, I'll check it out. It is. It's really well done. I, at least at the time I thought, oh, finally, like I got, I, whoever was doing the choose, I should probably know the name of the people running AMC because when they gave Breaking Bad a chance and, I think they gave a lot of great shows a, a chance. Yeah. I, I think they definitely were the first people to come along and show that a, there's more than just HBO if you want quality. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, All right. Well, heck, uh, you want to tell people your website and social media, and then I'll, I'll ramble off mine and, and we can, and we can hit stop. For sure. Um, My website is rachelspoonerthomas.com and on Instagram at Rachel Spooner Thomas. Rachel Spooner Thomas, which I'm just going to tease you, might be the most New England name I know. (laughs) Oh, um, the Spooner part, there's a Spooner Museum down in Plymouth because um, my relatives came over on the Mayflower. So, yes, extremely New England. (laughs) See? See, that's why uh, I like <laughs> hanging with you. You're, it's my only chance to be high, well, around some high society, highbrow people. I can get into those fancy country clubs if I wanted, but uh, I haven't tried. <laughs> you're, you're not, you don't like flexing your, your, um, your Mayflower cred. I'd rather be at a film festival. <laughs> for sure, for sure. All right, well, you have just listened to, should I say, Rachel Spooner, Thomas Medwood, like make it really long, like... Like one of those names from Spain with like five last names. You've just listened to Rachel answer the four questions. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, You should check out her work at her website, rachelspoonerthomas.com. And also, if you want to see something, go to Discover Indie Film on Amazon Prime Video. And uh, season five, which is probably coming out in March of 2022, will have her directorial debut, The Squirrels in the Attic. Uh, her great film that won the Audience Award at Film Invasion LA in 2020. Uh, her film in the Company Crows was at Film Invasion LA in 2021. So if you want to learn about this awesome festival that that has uh, featured Rachel's work twice, and then uh, that's Film Invasion Los Angeles, which is every June. You can learn about it at FilmInvasionLA.com. And on social media, it's at Film Invasion LA. And I first met Rachel at the Sherman Oaks Film Festival, where her script, The Lost Opera, won an award that was in 2018 so that means in this november uh, it will be four years four years ago that i met rachel and you can learn about that festival that happens every november if you go to shermanoaksff.com or at shermanoaksff on social media and i think i forgot to ask for five stars but i'll grade grub if you uh, are listening to this give this five stars give the uh, go on amazon.com and give the Amazon, I give, give the Discovery New Film TV series five stars if you can. And if you want to learn more about this podcast and the TV series that was born from it, just go to discoverynewfilm.com and it's at DIF Wins on social media. And my internet has been shitty and Rachel's been freezing off and on, which means I bet I'm freezing for her. But now she can probably hear me. But I think it recorded me when our connection sucked. So I'm going to say goodbye, Rachel. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for doing this. It was a pleasure. Something we, I think we've been talking about, I I don't know. I hope you knew you were going to do this podcast someday. (laughs) (laughs) I did. (laughs) You were definitely on the list for a long time for me. All right. Well, thank you for doing it. And thank you everyone for listening.